As you know, on Sunday night or Monday morning of every week, we post a new expository semiotics explaining why we would choose which lectionary readings. But in these readings, our dream is and our, our desire is to help you read the signs and fondle the details and spot the seminal metaphors, the condensed signs and the stories that are key for preaching to a digital culture. So strap on your seatbelt and join us as we prospect our passages for today. Welcome to vlog number 46, the lectionary passages for the 31st of January, 2021. We begin with a passage from Deuteronomy where God is providing for the priests, the Levites, and then God also um, mentions that God will raise up prophets. And this is the 18th chapter and the, um, the, the call to holiness that, follow, that is followed by this call to, to prophethood. I, I really think that what the priesthood of all believers was to the Protestant Reformation what God is doing today in whatever you want to call this new thing that God is up to, that we are moving towards a prophethood of all believers. That's a phrase I first encountered, James Deotis Roberts, in calling the black church to a prophethood uh, status. But I think that prophethood goes to all believers now, that we all have a, a we're all a priests, the priesthood of all believers, but we all have a prophetic function. Um, and th this, this comes with a warning. I mean, yes, uh, you will listen. If you don't listen to the word that the prophets speak, um, you will be held accountable. But if you prophets, you don't speak what I tell you to speak and you speak your own messages, uh, you can read it here. There are serious consequences. The, the psalm is a psalm of praise, Psalm 111. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful uh, song of um, um, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom is where this comes from. And, and it's just singing praises to God over and over. The, uh, the epistle reading is from Romans, and, I mean, 1 Corinthians. Uh, the, the whole issue in the 8th chapter verses, what is it, 1 to 13 of food idols. And do we eat food? And is there an issue in eating food that was once offered to idols? And, and then Paul's summons to uh, just watch out for, for your brother and sister who may not have the same sensibilities you do and sacrifice for them. Um, he also has this phrase here, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. And how many know-it-alls do you know? <laughs> Resident know-it-alls in the church that are so puffed up, you know, just drugged on the fumes of their own ego that, um, that we're not building up in love. We're, we're puffing up in, 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 our, in our knowledge and in our arrogance. So it's a, it's a great passage for that. But the, the one I wanna feature, the, the passage that follows the one last week for the casting of nets and the mending of nets, the calling of the first disciples, is this one in, um, that follows right after that, where the first thing Jesus does in his ministry is to heal. Now, we think of Jesus preacher, teacher, but Jesus is also healer. Remember, sozo, Jesus. Jesus saves, Jesus heals. Same word means both things. And so I want to read this passage to you, if I get my glasses on here, and want to read it because um, let, let's be clear about the first thing here is Jesus uh, comes to Capernaum, which is really his world headquarters in the beginning of his ministry. And here we go. They went to Capernaum and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and taught. Now, this is huge because he had, the, I don't want to get into the whole complexity here, but the fact that he could enter a synagogue and teach means that he had some street cred, some synagogue cred, some 
academic cred, if you will, to be worthy. They don't just let any run-of-the-mill person off the street come into synagogue and teach. So we got to do a little revisioning of where Jesus spent those 18 years. Um, because here, and he begins his ministry, he's got some cred, some serious cred. They were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. And this, this really means that, that what you do as, as a rabbi that teaches is you, you continue the teaching of your rabbi. So you always, the rabbi you studied under, your mentor. And so you always kind of hide behind, behind that rabbi. And you push his thoughts and his thoughts, and he's pushing his one. So you're keeping a tradition going. But you're not doing it in your own name. And Jesus here is going, you have heard it said. What next? But I say. He's speaking out of his own authority. And we have no idea how revolutionary this was, how radical this was, how astounding this was. So he, he spoke, taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. In their synagogue, there was a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, leave me alone or leave us alone. What do you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, it came out of him. They were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, What is this? What new teaching is this? What authority he commands, even his unclean, even the unclean spirits? And they obey him. Immediately his fame spread, and everywhere throughout the region surrounding Galilee. Be quiet and come out. And the unclean spirit came out. Jesus heals mind, body, spirit. Let me say that again. Sozo Jesus. But Jesus heals what? Mind, body, and spirit. Jesus still cares and still heals people with an unclean spirit. Now, what do you mean an unclean spirit? A crazed spirit. How about an ugly spirit? How about an ungrateful selfish, um, overbearing, uncaring spirit. Um, Jesus still heals bad spirits. Now they in the first century they don't have they don't have psychological sophistication like we do or they don't talk about mental illness and and uh, just depression and other things or just bad days. <laughs> but, we're still dealing with these same unclean spirits, every one of us. Every one of us has these times where we just kind of taken over by this unclean, we call it a bad mood, I don't care what you want to call it, but Jesus still cares and Jesus still heals and cures us of these unclean, ugly spirits. Now, Everyone you meet squirts a spirit. Now, I don't know how else to put it, but we all squirt a spirit. Uh, preachers, you, you know when you stand in front of your congregation and you're ready to preach, when the congregation gathered and they were all there, it's been a while, so you gotta remember. Collectively, that congregation gives off a, a spirit. And it's different every week. Sometimes it's a joyful spirit. Sometimes it's a troubled spirit. Sometimes it's a it's a um, an anxious spirit. But that, sisters and brothers, is the real world that you preach to. That's the real presence because the ultimate reality is the reality of spirit because spirit comes first the word became flesh spirit matters all spirits become flesh 
they matter. They come out in, in our attitudes, in our actions, in, in our looks, in our... And so, depending on what our spirit is, is, and you, you know that when you're meeting somebody, when you're just talking to them on the street, and you can sense what kind of spirit, and you can, it, this is the real world. This is why we are, this is what we should be learning in seminary, how to deal with, is to heal that, that spirit. Uh, yes, we're, we're to help heal the body, but you got medical people to do that. But our specialty, pastors, priests, prophets, is to heal the spirit. The, the real reality behind all realities is the reality of spirit, as God is spirit. Uh, 1905, Einstein published three little essays that revolutionized the world, totally changed the world. And in one of these, he said, and you notice how some of the greatest secrets are unlocked by the simplest formulas. This is very simple. The secrets of the universe can be Unlocked, he said, by this little formula, E equals mc squared. E is energy, m is mass, c is, is uh, constant, the, the constant, the speed of light, squared. Okay, E equals mc squared. This is 1905. In 1929, Sir Arthur Eddington, who was a Quaker astronomer and physicist, stood before the Royal Society of London all the greatest scientists in the world there. And he stands behind a table and he's lecturing, but he wants to honor Einstein. He says, you know, I just want to make sure that we're, we're clear here that, you know, this is the coming up on the 25th anniversary, this is 1929, of, of this remarkable insight. Um, and he wrote in 1929 a book based on these, these, this lecture to the Royal Society of London about the unseen world of science. But that um, E equals mc squared, let's understand this little formula that Einstein has come up with, that E stands for energy and m stands for mass, speed of light squared. Energy and matter, he says, what are they? They're basically the same thing. Matter is just a change in energy into a different form. And he, he illustrated by, he, he knocked on the table. He, he, by the table, he said, okay, what is this? It's a table made of wood, but what is it? Energy or matter? Which are you going to pick? Of course, all the signs go, well, of course, it's matter. He said, well, let me try again. He knocked again. What is this table? Is it spirit or substance? I don't know, well, of course, it's substance. He goes, no, see, if you understand Einstein, the correct answer is both. It's both. It's equally spirit. It's equally substance. It's equally energy. It's equally matter. In fact, he said, um, let's just see how much matter there is to matter. Anybody got a match? Let's change this matter into a different molecular form. It'll still be this table, but it'll just be a table in a different form. Anybody got a match? And let's see how much matter matters. You and I are all the the human organization of energy, the flesh mattering of the spirit. And, and preachers, every time you stand in front of your people, you're basically empty space. You're just full of holes. The question is, what are you going to allow to fill those holes in your spirit and in, in your being? What kind of energy are you? What kind of spirit? Is it going to be your spirit or the holy spirit? So the fundamental realities of the universe are spirit. And we all have to deal with these bad spirits, these ugly spirits, these unclean spirits. I mean, it's hard. You can't watch television anymore. We're being bombarded by images that are violent and, and barbaric. And, and we need rituals of purging to... Oh, one of the last things I did, at the request of my mother, she's dying in the hospital, congestive heart failure, she asked me to read passages to her. And one of the last ones she asked me to read was Psalm 5110. Created me a what? clean heart, O oh God, and put a right spirit within me. A right spirit. And we all, we all need that right spirit. And that's what Jesus can heal us for, is a right spirit. After, after she died, my spirit went into a tailspin. 
And literally, um, I all of a sudden realized I'm an orphan. I've lost both my parents. I'm in this world alone now. My mother lived with me the last 11 years of her life and was a primary support system for me. I stole a lot of my best sermon ideas from my mother. And, and I, I just went into it. And some people could say, sweet, your spirit is really troubled. Are you okay? And I go, yeah, I'm, I'm really missing mother more than I thought I ever would. And then one day I said, Lord, you got, you got to put a right spirit in me. My spirit's not right. And it just came to me, why don't you read the whole psalm? <laughs> what do you mean read the whole psalm? Yeah, read the whole psalm. You only read verse 10, but read the whole psalm. Oh, there is a concept. See, I was, I was in this versitis mode. And, and I read the whole psalm. And something that hit me. Here, this is the psalm of David. The David psalm of forgiveness and repentance after he had messed up. He's he going, okay, and he defines actually what a right spirit is in, in this psalm. And, and he, he, after he put a right spirit with him, he defines what the right spirit is. And he goes, we can teach Zion, we can restore Zion, and we can teach the people your ways, and we can do this, and we can do this. And you get all these, we can do, we can do, we can do. And then it all comes to a crashing halt. But the only acceptable spirit to you, O oh God, is a broken and contrite heart. And all of a sudden it hit me, that's it. That's a right spirit. That's the spirit that we all need in us. That's a Jesus spirit. The spirit of confidence. I can do this. We can do this. We can do this. We can do this. But there's only one way we can do it, and that is the broken. See, it's confidence and humility put together. I can do what? All things. You can't more, get more confident than that. I can do all things. That's confidence. But wait a minute. It's confidence that's chastened and chastised by what? I can do all things only what? Through Christ who gives me courage. Oh, you get it? Without Christ, I can do nothing. That's humility. But with Christ, I can do all things. And what brings together the confidence and the humility is, is the courage, the courage, the strength to believe enough. And to be able to say with Paul, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. A right spirit, sisters and brothers. Jesus wants to put in us cleanse us from these ugly spirits of negativity and pessimism and i'm a prayerful optimist but a prayerless pessimist so i pray a lot but that's why i'm standing here in front of this is the door to my study and i every time i go to my study this is a nautical door off a ship, Russian ship, actually. It was dismantled in India. I brought it, bought it in New Jersey. But I have to do two things at the same time. The, the Jews have a saying that an hour of studies in the eyes of God is an hour of prayer. So this is where I go to write and to study. But as I enter my study, I have to do something. I have to humble myself. I have to bow down. I have to have a humble and contrite heart. But at the same time as I bow down, notice it's about, what, eight inches off the floor. I have to step up. I have to have the confidence to step up to the challenge, to the quest, to whatever I, I'm, I'm trying to question and figure out. And so, Every entrance into my study is a, a devotional exercise, a little ritual. The Lord put a right spirit in me. Give me the humility to bow. But give me the confidence to step up to the mission and to the calling that you've given me. This is a right spirit. This is what, and the, the spirits that are keeping us from doing this are what Jesus wants to cast out and to purge us and to expel from us. In 
1551. His name is Louis Bourgeois. He was the um, choir master um, and or of the John Calvin's church in Geneva. And he composed a little tune in 1551 that um, a few years later in 1560, a, a Scottish friend of John Knox heard, picked up and said, I'm gonna put some lyrics to that. And what he put to it was Psalm 100. Now we know the tune because we sing the doxology to this tune. So this is maybe the oldest English tune still sung in churches today, um, the tune to the doxology. But we also know it, and this may be the oldest hymn still sung in churches. And when the settlers came to the new world, this was a hymn that they probably sang. And this um, may have been one of the earliest hymns that was sung in the new world by the settlers from, from Europe. And we all know it by the old hundredth, the old hundredth, Psalm 100. And the words are these, all people, you know it, that on earth do dwell. Sing to the Lord with cheerful voice. Him serve with mirth. His praise foretell. Come ye before him and rejoice. The sign of a Jesus spirit is the confidence, the humble confidence, the courage to bring together confidence and humility. But the expression of it being lived is cheerful voice come before him with mirth and foretell that prophetic function, the courage. But the courage and the cheer of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. It's really just another way of talking about Micah 6, 8. What does the Lord require of you? But to what? Walk humbly. That's humility. Do justly. That's confidence. To seek justice. But to love mercy, the courage and the strength to bring that humble confidence together, that walking humbly and doing justly, the triangulation of faith, courage, confidence, humility, a Jesus spirit. Tell your people that Jesus is still in the business of caring for unclean spirits and curing unclean spirits. Semiotics is the art of angling, of turning things askew, upside down, inside out, cattywampus, sunny side up, over easy, scrambled, hard boiled. We hope you enjoyed today's journey, but always remember, it's more important you prepare the preacher than you prepare the sermon.